coming. We have so many special guests planned that are coming. We're also going to have the special music. I hope you enjoyed it this morning. And we're going to have more just like that. And uh, you need to probably start exercising because in the mornings, um, we're going to start off our worship fast and get up and go. And we're going to have a wonderful time. And then we'll bring it down and time to hear um, what God has spoken to Zane to speak today. morning's reading continues in the first letter of Peter. Be alert. Be on watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Be firm in your faith and resist him, because you know that other believers in all the world are going through the same kind of sufferings. But after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who calls you to share his eternal glory in union with Christ, will himself perfect you and give you firmness, strength, and a sure foundation. To him be the power and the glory forever. Amen. Joe Theismann was the victim of one of the most devastating hits in football history. I've talked with you about that before. Would any of you like to see it? Yes, you saw that reaction, right? It was horrible. Let me tell you about it. It was a Monday night game, and uh, it was between the New York Giants and the Washington Redskins. Does this bother you for me to have this thing up here by my nose? Really, does it? You don't care? Doesn't matter? I don't want to hear anybody going out and posting on Facebook. Zane looked like he had a big zit on his nose today. But it kind of sticks up there. New York Giants, Washington Redskins. Quarterback Theismann goes back to pass. Almost simultaneously, he's hit by two players. One player, whom I don't remember, hit him low near the knees, but about the same time, Lawrence Taylor, who was one of the most fearsome linebackers ever to play the game, delivers this devastating blow from the other side. And it was a career ender. Theismann was done after that. Taylor hit him from what's commonly known as the blind side. You had the force of opposing blows and the planting of a foot with a cleated shoe, and the result was a break in the lower leg between the knee and the ankle that just ended Theismann's career. It was a blind side hit. If you ever saw the movie The Blind Side, you know that Michael... Or was trained and responsible for protecting the blind side of the quarterback. That was his job. That's why the movie was called that. That was his job. Because when a guy has his back to defenders, he's more subject to injury. And that's what happened to Theismann. It was horrible. If you really want to see it, Google it. Just T-H-E-I-S, like the is man and he didn't look like much man when he was writhing around on the ground crumpled up in a heap hey, that's an uncanny description too it's an uncanny description of how our greatest enemy works and it's crucial that we understand that since we are engaged in an ongoing spiritual warfare whether you want to admit it or not whether you like it or not if you say, yes, I am going to follow Jesus from that point on until Jesus comes back or you die, you will
will be engaged in warfare. Now, when we who are followers of Jesus set our minds to reaching our goal of becoming more and more like him, we sometimes fail to sense the presence of the enemy. Whether it's distraction by things that are going on or some disruption in our life or some disturbance, the devil often seems to come out of nowhere when we're least expecting it and with a vicious blindside hit, he will send us down in a heap of sin and pain and discouragement. Any of you ever had that happen? never saw it coming, then all of a sudden, boom, and you feel like you've been crushed. This is why Peter ends his letter with the words that you heard Mel read. Let's look at them one more time, okay? Be sober-minded has nothing to do with alcohol consumption. It has everything to do with being clear-headed. Be sober-minded and be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Now, let me tell you something. As much as you would like to, to blame what's happening in the world on the devil, the devil doesn't spend nearly as much time exercising uh, a pressure or, or, or temptation or, or things like that on people who do not follow Jesus. What have I always told you about folks that don't follow Jesus? They're going to do what people that don't follow Jesus do. They're going to live selfishly. They're going to sin. And none of that should surprise us. It should be much more surprising when someone that says, I follow Jesus, acts like somebody that doesn't. So basically, what I'm saying is, if you're marching in the same direction... If you're marching in the same direction, wearing the same uniform, you're probably not going to be connected or, 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 or confronted by the devil very often. It's just not going to happen. Because he knows he's got you, and he's going to depend on you making all kinds of decisions uh, during your lifetime that will bring about the, 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 the ruin and the pain and the sorrow and the death and destruction that he's known for. But man, when you put on the other uniform and you change your direction in life and you become a child of God, then you need to expect to be in a battle for the rest of your life. He is never going to leave you alone. Never, ever. But there are those occasional periods of peace. And when that happens, sometimes we Christians tend to overlook the reality and the ever presence of our enemy. Now, some people will say, oh, I, haven't seen I know enough about the Bible and I've heard enough preachers say it, that the devil is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere and every time. And I understand that. And you're absolutely right. It's true. But did you also know that he has millions of minions? And they're not the cute little things in Despicable Me. They are creatures that are so devastatingly evil that some of them, after being cast out of heaven, were not even allowed to roam the earth. They have been kept in a pit right up until this day. <coughs> <coughs> Too much singing. Uh, anyway. Just for a moment, let's look at some biblical blindside hits, okay, and see the difference in how they were handled, okay? In Genesis chapter 39, there is a young man named Joseph. 
possibly 17 or 18 years old, no, no older than 20. He's been sold into slavery by his brothers. He's in a foreign land far away from his family. He's been sold to a guy named Potiphar who is a soldier. And what you read in the scriptures throughout his life is that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And apparently Joseph was with the Lord because God kept promoting him even though he was in slavery even though he ended up in prison, God kept promoting him to areas of responsibility and influence. And so there came a time when he was the one that was kind of like the major domo, the house manager for all of Potiphar's affairs. And he was probably very attractive to an aging woman who whose husband was busy and who still wanted to be considered beautiful and attractive. And so she began to proposition him. Ask your parents. Uh, <clears throat> she began to proposition him right down to the point where when she had had enough talk, she grabbed him. And just basically said, sleep with me. Have sex with me. And knowing no other way of escape, he just left her holding his cloak and ran away. <laughs> Classic sexual harassment. But yeah, I love, I love Joseph's words in Genesis chapter 39, verse 9, when she first started talking with him about this. He said to her, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? See, that revealed his spiritual sensitivity not only to the nearness of God, but also to the presence of the enemy. So, how's that? Ultimately, he runs away from the temptation. He leaves his cloak in the grasp of this woman. And even though he did absolutely the right thing, the result was years of unjustified imprisonment. He was in prison perhaps 12 or 13 years. Somewhere between 8 and 13 years. And his response to the blind side hit by the devil was near perfect. It was pretty near perfect. Now, let's look at another one. 2 Samuel chapter 11. King David, at a time it was springtime, the roads were drying out from the winter rains, the crops had been planted, <coughs> and so there was going to be food for the troops, and this is traditionally <coughs> when armies went out to war. And David was the warrior king. That was his gift. But on this particular time, whatever the reason, maybe his soldiers convinced him, his, his advisors, that he really didn't need to go. And so he's not out taking care of business like he should have been. Instead, he's hanging around the palace. He goes to a palace window, and he looks out and sees this beautiful young woman bathing on the rooftop of her home. Now, that's not uncommon. They're going to do this. Uh, these people used the roofs of their houses. They were flat roofs, and, and they, would, they would go up there in the cool of the evening. They would go up there to get away from the bugs. They would go up there sometimes to bathe. Uh, probably no other building could she have been seen but from the palace. So I'm telling you that because I'm telling you that she had the expectation for a certain amount of privacy. I want, don't want you to think that she was out there just parading herself. David is responsible here. He's the responsible one. Instead of turning away from the temptation... Because the scripture tells us that she was one of the most beautiful women in all of Israel. 
So instead of turning away from the temptation, he began to lust after her. Now, how do we know this? Well, instead of walking away from the window and said, I don't need to be looking at that, he asked about her. And then he pursued her until he finally had a sexual affair with her, even though he knew she was the husband, uh, the wife of another man. She had a husband. And by the way, you talk about the abuse of your authority. You may not understand it, but in those days, if you were a woman and the king said, do something, you did it because you didn't know what would happen if you didn't. So the devil hits him blindside, and his inappropriate response to that adversely affected him and his family and his future. This guy's family was a mess. If you ever do a study of the life of David, and we may do that in the near future, you'll discover that as great a king as he was and as great a man after God's own heart that he was, his sin had long-term effects and his family was a disaster. One of his own sons even rose up and tried to rebel against him and ended up being killed by Joab in a battle. He had one son that raped, that was a rapist. I mean, it was just horrible. So to think that if we just fall into these blindside traps by the devil and just ask God's forgiveness, it'll all be done and over with. The guilt of your sin may be, but the consequences of your sin may go on and on for generations. Basically, David's response to the blindside uh, uh, hit of the devil was to crumple into a heap of guilt and sorrow when this old prophet named David came in, uh, Nathan came in and told him a story about this rich man that took advantage of a poor man. And David, in his self-righteousness, starts screaming and ranting and saying, Who is the man? Bring him to me because he's going to die. You ever heard people talk about preachers that had extra long fingers? Because every time they pointed out at the congregation, they appear to be pointing at you. I can just see Nathan's finger being about a foot long as he comes out and says, You are that man. And David just crumples there. Yeah. He didn't handle it well. As great a man of God as he was, he did not handle it well. <coughs> And then in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, right after his baptism and before the beginning of his public ministry, Jesus. You know, it's interesting. If you go to that text, most English translations will translate it something like Jesus went into the desert to be tempted by the devil. But that... Those kinds of translations really don't get to the intensity of the situation. What the Greek says is that the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, pushed him out there. Remember the Spirit came and descended on him like a, like a dove at the baptism? And once he's baptized, the Spirit is now saying, you have some work to do. And he's pushing him into a barren, deserted group of mountains there in Galilee. And he says, you got 40 days to fast and pray and to seek the Father. And at the end of the 40 days, suddenly he's face to face with Satan himself. Three times he's tempted to deviate from the Father's plan for his life. I know you're hungry. You haven't eaten in 40 days. You can say the word and these rocks will become bread and then you can eat. What did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone. 
but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do you know where that comes from? So that comes from the book of Deuteronomy. You see the weapon that Jesus is using against the devil? He's not standing there and saying, Devil, I'm Jesus! He's using the Word of God. Takes him up onto the pinnacle of the temple and says, You know, just look around here. You know, all these people that you, 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 you say you love so much, you know, if you just jump off of here, you know you're not going to get hurt because the Scriptures say, look at who else can quote Scripture. Ooh. Only problem is he has a tendency to leave out parts and pick and choose, just like some preachers I've heard. Uh, Just jump, and he'll give his angels charge over you, and they'll rescue you, and you'll not dash your foot against the stone. And then every one of them will believe in you. That's not the way the Father planned for it to be done. Jesus' response, you should not put the Lord your God to a foolish test. Old Testament scripture. Then the third temptation takes him up on the highest mountain peak they could find and he says look out over this all of this belongs to me and it's true you know he is known as the prince of this world right now so he's saying I have all of this is mine and if you will just bow down and worship me it'll all be yours and Jesus said, what did he say first, though? You shall remember the Shema? It's spelled Shema, but we covered it some months ago it's, it's pronounced Shema S-H-E-M-A and it's that Jewish saying that they recited morning and night Hear O Israel the Lord your God is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart soul mind and strength and he says you should not worship any other God which was one of the commandments right then he tells him to get away and the people left him for a season I'm saying that because I want you to understand what his primary weapon is in overcoming the devil. It's the scriptures. It's the scriptures. You know? Three times he used scripture to resist and overcome the devil. And this wouldn't be the last time that they would be face to face because it says there that the devil just left him for a season. So if you ever think that you can resist the devil to the point that he's not coming back at you, you're wrong. Now, just who is this adversary, the devil? Peter, Peter says he's your adversary, the devil. Adversary in the Greek means opponent. And it really it is like an opponent or an, a plaintiff in a lawsuit. If you, any of you ever been sued, got in a car wreck, you probably have had some Bill Green type lawyer come after you at some point. Uh, <coughs> Satan is regularly bringing suit against us before God. <clears throat> what he does is he brings up our sins. He highlights our weaknesses and failures. He casts doubt on our salvation. He is an antagonistic opponent. He's an adversary. And he never lets up. You know, in this life, there's never going to be a time when he's going to leave you alone. Now, devil in the Greek, and it's just like it is in the Spanish almost, diablos, literally means accuser or slanderer. The book of Revelation, not Revelations, there's no S on the end of it. If you say Revelations, you are out there somewhere. It is 
a revelation. It's the revelation to St. John the Apostle. All right. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters in Christ. But he's already been defeated. It is he who accuses us before God. What was he doing in heaven in the book of Job? He was there to accuse Job. Because as soon as he arrived, God said, Have you taken notice of my servant Job? And he said, Yes, I have. And why wouldn't he love you and serve you like he does? Because you give him everything he wants. But if you take it away from him, he'll curse you. Obviously, the devil did not know Job as well as God did. He's an accuser. It is he who accuses us before God. It is he who accuses us before others. And by the way, <laughs> you do understand that accusations really have no merit or basis unless they're true. So for people to get upset when somebody accuses them of something and yet they're still guilty, that's probably just a guilty conscience putting up all that fight. But when you know that you've not done anything wrong and people slander and accuse you, then you understand what it is to suffer as Jesus did. It is he who accuses us to others in that respect. It is the devil who perpetuates gossip and rumors, and half-truths, and lies. And he's so good at that because his lies resemble the truth. Now in John chapter 14, verse 30, that's where Jesus himself called Satan the ruler of this world, the prince of this world. <coughs> so Jesus wasn't surprised when the devil took him to that mountaintop and said, I own all this. That didn't surprise Jesus. Because he knew for the time being it did belong to the devil. He's the ruler or prince of this world. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, Paul calls him the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Now I want you to understand what that means. Uh, you know, it, it, it simply means that he rules over this invisible kingdom just as Jesus does. But Satan's invisible kingdom consists of creatures and demons and fallen beings that we cannot imagine, fallen angels, who do his bidding. You've probably never seen one. I haven't. You've probably never heard one. I haven't. <coughs> Except for the occasional whisper in the ear or in the heart that tells you to pursue after something that you know is not within the will of God. These folks don't attack. I mean, you can go see movies like The Exorcist and things like that. And those, those movies just intrigue me, the, the, the exorcism of Emily Rose, those kinds of things. But uh, they intrigue me in the daytime. At nighttime, they scare me to death. Anyway, uh, you know, th that, that's, that's not the normal way that the devil is going to come after you. And... That's why Peter says he prowls. Now, by the way, let me just stop here and say, give, give you some other references about the devil himself. The John chapter 8, verse 44, it's Jesus who calls him the father of lies. Jesus tells the Pharisees and Sadducees, you are liars, you are children of your father the devil, who is the father of lies. He is also referred to as Abaddon or Apollyon, and both of those names from the, 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 the Latin and the Greek mean the destroyer or the destructor. You remember in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief 
only comes to do what? Three things. He comes to steal, he comes to kill, and he comes to destroy. Who do you think he's talking about there? The devil is referred to as a serpent or a dragon or, a, or the prince of darkness. In other, I'm just trying to throw this out there for you because I want you to understand some things about him. Number one, he's real. There are people out there who, who will uh, suggest that the more educated you get, the wiser you get, and the more worldly you get, the more you don't believe in a being like the devil. And that just works right into the devil's playbook because the less you believe that he is real and formidable, the more effective he is in working in your life and working through your life. He is a dangerous and diabolical foe. And we are the people who should never forget that. We should never overlook the reality of the devil. And that's why Peter tells us to be sober and watchful. I kind of like the, the New Living Translation, which says, Stay alert and watch out for your great enemy. Now, I don't know about you, but when I go out in the yard at night, I always put on shoes, and I always carry a flashlight. Would you have any idea why I do that? What am I watching for? What am I alert for? It's dark out there. And if Vicky hasn't cut the grass, the grass might be tall there. And I never know what I might run into, so I make sure I got shoes on and I make sure I got a flashlight so I can see this rascal sneaking up on me. <coughs> you go down where Cameron lives in Daytona, you, you have to really look for them because they try to eat you down there, you know, all the boas and pythons and things like that. Yeah, and, and this is kind of the idea that he's getting at. You, you don't take any chances with this. The devil and his invisible forces are formidable and they hate God. And that all started from the pride that caused their expulsion from heaven. Y'all know this story? The devil was a highly ranked seraph. Seraphim is the plural version, just as cherubim is the plural version. Singular, it's cherub and seraph. Seraph are these magnificent beings like Gabriel and Michael. Some call them archangels. They have their roles. Gabriel is a messenger. Michael is the commander of the Lord's armies. Lucifer, Lucifer apparently was a master of praise and worship, a master of music and arts. And at some point, he felt like it would be best if he took the place of God. Yeah, sin among the angelic forces. Created by God for the purpose of serving him. It ended up with them being him, him and those that followed after him being expelled from heaven in a war. This, the, the story is told symbolically in just a few verses in the scriptures. We don't, I saw some stupid saying from some guy that considers himself a philosopher when I was researching for this, and he said, uh, we've not heard the devil's side of the story. God wrote the whole book. Well, let me tell you something. Anybody that's ever had any dealings with the devil knows that you can't trust anything he says anyway. Yeah. He does post a lot on Facebook, though. I'm just telling you. Okay. Now, some of you are giggling about that, but I'm, I'm, I'm not. 
He may not type it with his own fingers, but he posts a lot on Facebook, and people believe it. So just be careful about that. Let me tell you where you can find it so you can read it yourself. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12, 13, and 14. The prophet Isaiah gives us a little bit of a symbolic look at what happened. Ezekiel, the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel, chapter 28, verses 12 through 18. Any of you ever read John Milton's Paradise Lost? You know, why am I not surprised by that? I read it. That's me. I read it because I was forced to in college. Anyway, but it, there were some interesting things to it. But I always thought, where did they get this figure that there's a third? You know, John Milton talked about a third of the angels being cast out. And in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, in the vision, the apocalypse, the revelation that John gets, he tells about a time when a third of the stars of heaven were cast down. And I think that's probably where folks probably just kind of connect that with the stories in Isaiah and Ezekiel and think this is a time when God just cast it out. And, and I, for one, think that all of this happened after the creation. Uh, we'll talk about that another time when we're just talking. Anyway, <coughs> so you had this Luciferian rebellion in heaven. And all uh, Lucifer is cast out and he becomes, the, you know, paradise lost. He, he's cast out and he stands up and he says, it is better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. That's, that's the classic line from that. Uh, and so he and those that were cast out with him have been working together all of this time just to hit back and strike back at God in every way that they can. Now let me tell you something. Some of those that were cast out have never been freed. Some of them that were cast out have been confined since that moment to a place that is called in the scriptures the abyss. Most common English translation, the pit. Now, if you remember the story of Jesus going over and seeing this Gadarene maniac, a demoniac, this guy that was possessed by a legion of demons, and they recognized Jesus. This guy was just beating up anybody that ever tried to stop him from doing whatever he wanted to do. But when he saw Jesus, he ran and fell to his knees and the demons begin to speak and say, What do you have to do with us, you holy one? And do you know what they asked him when they knew that they couldn't stay in this man? Please don't send us to the pit. <coughs> <coughs> so if you ever wonder what hell will be like for those who choose to reject God's offer of grace and mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the demons fear the pit. Don't send us to the pit. Let us go into those pigs over there. Jesus said, do what you want. But there are some demons who are so evil, they've been confined to the pit throughout all this time. And there'll come a time when the church is taken out at the rapture and the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth. And guess who will be released from the pit? During the greatest tribulation the world has ever known. Now let's forget about the pit for a minute because I want you to understand that there are other demonic beings that freely roam the earth as a part of Satan's invisible kingdom and they always have the same goal that he has and that is they hate God and they'll do whatever they can to hurt God so you and I become the battlefield. You know, every parent knows this. You want to do something to me, you hurt me, I can deal with it. But man, if you really want to cut me to the bone, you do something to hurt my children. 
Satan knows that he has no chance of victory over the almighty God, so he comes after his children. Ooh. And so Peter tells us, this devil, this adversary, he's a predator. He's a predator. That's your last thing there under that. He's like a roaring lion. Now let me tell you something. Lions don't roar when they're hunting. Lions roar when they want to instill fear. But that word prowl there, that's an interesting word. I went to the Cambridge Dictionary, Cambridge University Dictionary. It defines prowl as to move around an area quietly and secretly as when hunting. Prowling predators lurk about in the dark or in the cover of brush. They stalk their prey. And this is the way Satan and his demonic allies pursue us. They're never going to hit us head on. They're never going to telegraph their intentions. And they never have good intentions. C.S. Lewis once suggested that there are two fundamental mistakes that followers of Jesus make when it comes to the devil. We either joke about him or we ignore him. And if we do either one of those, we put out the scent of a weak or wounded creature. Joking and ignoring are not viable options of those who want to overcome the devil and his minions. And I mean, listen, the, the great apostle John. In his first letter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, says this, You belong to God, my dear children, and you have already conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead that lives in you is greater than the devil. Who? Isn't that interesting? You know, it just surprises me. I know we're Baptists, okay? I know we're Baptists. Do I need to set you free to say amen or praise God occasionally? Because a verse like that and you just sit there, does it not excite you to hear that? I guess not. I, don't make me be one of those guys that have to ask for an amen. Can I get an amen? amen. Dude, I, I hate that. I hate having to ask. I give you permission if something in God you, just excites you that God says through the scriptures, just let people know, yeah. You do it at a ball game. You do it at a band competition. You might even do it for a beauty pageant. I don't know. You wouldn't do it at a golf match because they'd call you down for it. But, yeah, it's other things. Hockey games, you know, NASCAR races. You'd, you'd get excited and shout. And we never do that because we're Baptists. Now, if you ever start overdoing it, I'll tell you. Yeah. Because our verbal shouts and our verbal amen should be to the Lord and not to a man. Okay? Now, how do we defeat this guy? A couple, three things, okay? First, you respect him. How often do we see stories, read stories, hear stories about warriors and athletes and others who lose even though they're more talented and more vigorous, but they lose simply because they underestimate their enemy. They underestimate their appoint, opponent. Never underestimate the devil. His great hope in this world is that 
he will be ignored. He's like a prowling thief or one of those crocodiles lurking just beneath the surface while the water buffalo come down to get a drink, you know. He does his most effective work on us when we discount him as if he's not there. He is real. He is powerful. He is cunning. And he prefers a blindside hit. And when it happens, he can kill reputations. He can destroy relationships. He can steal joy and fulfillment. <coughs> and his targets are children of God. So you need to know him. You need to respect him. You don't need to fear him, but you need to respect him. And you need to call him by name when you see him working. Because he hates being marked. He hates being called out. He hates being identified. Okay? So respect this, this creature. Secondly, resisting, resist him being firm in the faith. Let's just read it like it is. <coughs> now resist means to withstand. Or a secondary definition is to be firm against an attack. I like that. The whole theme of this book has been to stand firm in your suffering. Stand firm when you're mistreated. Stand firm when you're falsely accused. Stand firm when the devil attacks you. Now understand that we cannot fight the devil. We don't have what it takes alone. No matter how strong we think we are, we have no power over the devil in our own strength. I've seen people from time to time, particularly not from Baptist. I was at one time one of those folks that thought that I had, I was so good and so close to the Lord and so godly that I had some kind of spell over the devil that he wouldn't even want to be anywhere near me. And then I was reminded of what a sinner I was even on my best days. And I really didn't need to be counting anything in me that great. Let me tell you something. The devil doesn't fear you. No matter who you are. No matter how long you've been a Christian. No matter how many chapters of the scripture you read today. No matter how long you spent on your knees today. He doesn't fear you. If there's anything that does cause him some trepidation. It's probably seeing God's people on their knees because we don't go there very often. But we have no power over the devil on our own. We just don't. But when we stand firm in our faith in the Lord Jesus and when we have learned by reading and studying and memorizing the scriptures and we are still strengthened by our intimacy with God in prayer, the El Gabor, as I talked about in the first prayer of the day, the prevailing, conquering God. That's what El Gabor means. When those things are true in our lives, we can overcome this beast. But here's the third thing. We must persist in spite of suffering. Look at verse 9. Resist him, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the word. I, I take you to that verse because I want you to know that when you, when you do battle with the devil, there will be wounds. When you stand firm in your faith, especially in the midst of a culture that is anti-Christ, you will suffer. But you must always hold to the truth that suffering is temporary and eternity is coming. We must persist in standing firm against the devil, even in the midst of our suffering. And then the, the last thing down there is just an obvious from, from, from number two. We must always remember that it is the power of the Lord Jesus and not ourselves that overcomes the devil. If you look over at chapter 19 of uh, chapter 10 of Luke verse 19 
Jesus had sent these guys out on a, a mission. Seventy of them. <laughs> Seventy-two of them. And they had gone out on this mission and ministry, and they came back. Look at verse 17. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Look at what Jesus says. And I can just see him sitting there with this big grin on his face as he listens to all these testimonies. And he says, you know, I've been waiting and watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Wouldn't be the first time he saw that. <coughs> and why was he using those words? Because he had given them the authority and the power that they needed to defeat the devil, to overcome. They were casting out demons. They were freeing people of diseases. People were coming to faith in the Lord Jesus because of their preaching and teaching. It was just a pushback against the gates of hell. He said, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. And let me tell you something before any of you go out and try that, okay? This is exactly why I didn't grab that snake by the tail. You ever heard of a metaphor? So what do you think snakes and scorpions are metaphorical for? Instruments of evil. The devil. What did he appear to Eve as? And we just assume that's a snake. You know, when he's talking here, he's not talking about us going out and picking up rattlesnakes and water moccasins and kissing them on the lips and stuff like that. You know, that's just stupid. You know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not throwing down any other churches. I'm just thinking about the guy in, in Florida few months back that thought he could kiss his water moccasin on the lips and he ended up regretting that decision. I think probably alcohol played some role in that. They usually do. Uh, but this is what he's saying. He's saying, I'm giving you authority to trample on the snakes and scorpions, everything that represents the devil and over all of the power of the enemy. See that? <coughs> Nothing at all will harm you. But then he says, don't rejoice over that, though. Rejoice over the fact that your names are written down in heaven. Okay? So, you learn anything? You got any weapons that you can use now? Do you have an understanding of who your enemy is? Yeah. Peter goes on to say, and this is where we end, Peter goes on to say, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore and establish and strengthen and support you after you've suffered a little while. To him be dominion. That means control. Even when we're suffering, we realize that God is ultimately in control and that he will pull us through this and that he will restore and establish and strengthen and support. You know, we, we don't lose. We do not lose. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The greatest priority that the devil has is to keep you away from Jesus. That's it. If you don't follow Jesus, if you don't claim to be a Christian, if you don't care about this stuff that's fine with him and his deal is I just want to keep you that way when you're going the right way when you're going the same way he is wearing the same uniform he's wearing you, you, you're going to get the same result that he gets though and at the end he is the one that gets cast into the pit But that priority is the same for those of you that say, I follow Jesus too. It's still their priority to keep you from Jesus. How do they do that? From the millions of professing Christians who never crack their Bible during the week.
the millions of Christians who are professing Christians that never bend the knee before God to pray. For millions of Christians who since the day that they said by coming to the, aisle, uh, to the altar or being baptized in the river or raising their hand or signing a paper at a youth conference or whatever they did, since that day they have never wept at an altar again because of sin and suffering and God's call on their lives. They just want to keep you from Jesus. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, but they can keep you from Jesus, you're very ineffective. You have very little impact on your family. You have very little impact on the world around you. And that's what they like about followers of Jesus. They like the ones who don't have any impact. Now you see what you have to overcome. And it takes some discipline. You've got to want it. You've got to be willing to put up with the suffering. And today, some of you may need to make an altar right there at your chair. Some of you may want to come to this altar. Some of you may need to go to someone and say, you know what, our relationship's been strained for a while. It needs to stop now so that we can be united in Christ. Yeah. Some of you, you need to commit yourself to be spending time in the Word so that you have the tool that you need to offend the devil and resist him. Some of you need to become more intimate with God. He's been waiting for you, but you never meet him. You never get on your knees before him. You never just stop talking and listening to hear what he has to say to you. Some of you might need to have God take you back to that place where you first trusted him and there was some excitement in your life. You were filled with joy. And then some of you, you've let him keep you away from Jesus long enough. Today's the day. We've identified him. We've told you about his strategies. And we've told him that you told you that you were the battlefield. And today the Spirit of God is nudging you and calling to you and saying, I'm drawing you to Jesus today. I want you to follow Jesus starting today. And you decide who wins that battle. get on the right side today let's pray Lord God speak to those now to whom you've been urging throughout this service I pray for those right now who have never followed Jesus never trusted you as Lord and Savior and yet today they see that urgency they Feel that urgency from the Spirit. May this be the day that they say, yes, I'm, I'm, I understand this battle now, this great spiritual warfare, and I want to be on the winning side, the right side, so today I'm going to follow Jesus with all my heart. Here's your prayer. Here's how you do that. Some of you have been here so long, you've heard it so many times, don't let it be fresh to you today pray something like this. God, I know that I'm a sinner and I can't change that about me. But I know that that's why you sent the Lord Jesus to die on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven and I could be adopted into the family of God. And I know that's why you raised him from the dead on the third day because that was your way of saying I accept his sacrifice as payment for all of the sins of the world. But it's like any gift, Lord. It's no good unless it's received. And so today I receive the gift of the Lord Jesus into my life. And I'm going to start following him today. 
Hey, that's pretty simple. And as I've told you before, it's a journey. It's not an event. This is the start. And we have some gentlemen who have some materials that can help you get off to the best start possible. And they may even want to pray with you before you go. But if you, we've got to know about your decision. So if you prayed that prayer for the first time today and you said, I'm going to follow Jesus starting today, right now, would you just lift your hand up and hold it there until one of the guys gets to you? And let them talk with you for a few minutes just a moment I'm following Jesus starting today and then for the rest of us who already follow Jesus are you ready to stand toe to toe with the devil what is it that you need to do this week pray more get into the word more fellowship with believers more we need each other for encouragement it's not just about making a decision today it's about taking action when we leave here and that's my prayer for you that this will not just be a decision to be made but an action to be taken in your life God thank you so much that we don't fight an unknowable enemy that we, we, you've given us all the resources in your word that we need to be able to stand toe to toe with him and overcome in the name of the Lord Jesus when we're firm in our faith so bless these folks as they go out now as believers and I pray that you would use them to affect the world around them, strengthen them as their prayer lives are strengthened, as their word time, their Their study of the scriptures is strengthened. And God used them to be witnesses to others. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Got a minute? We're going to do something. And if you you need to go, please do. Uh, Thank you for your patience with me. But we've done this before, and we didn't have a chance to do it during the prayer circle this morning. But uh, normally when we have folks in our congregation that are going to go through something (coughs) <coughs> that is potentially life-threatening or serious, we take the time to do a prayer circle around them. And Rosalind Walker is going to have a heart cath after having her uh, uh, nuclear stress test. Apparently she didn't shine on that test. So she's got a cath coming up on Wednesday, and we want to just take a moment to pray over her and if you'd like to be a part of that we're going to sit her in a chair right up here and we'll circle around her you put your hands on her you can if you can't you put your hands on somebody who's got their hands lift the other way oh the other one thank you hey i love these new chairs and and listen honestly if there are those of you that have to go don't feel bad about it uh, we uh, just do this as a way of encouragement and to assure